my name is Rebecca Yang. I am a breast surgeon. I'm a full-time breast surgeon. I started training 20 years ago, and I'm with Atlantic Breast Associates. And so I'm happy that you guys are taking care of our patients postoperatively. And we're going to talk about postoperative care for our women that get mastectomies. Um, so a mastectomy, just for very basics, I'm sure you all know, but a mastectomy means we're removing all the breast tissue. And a lot of times when we perform a mastectomy, we're also removing some lymph nodes in the armpit on the same side. And most commonly it's called a sentinel lymph node biopsy, where we are finding the lymph nodes where cancer would go first. So it helps us stage the woman's breast cancer. Um, the reasons women get mastectomies are a couple, there's a couple different main reasons why a woman would get a mastectomy over a lumpectomy, which is just removing the lump with a little bit of extra tissue, and those women you generally don't see postoperatively because they go home. A mastectomy, um, it requires a drain. So that's one of the main reasons why they're being admitted to you guys for drain management. Um, so the main reason for women having a mastectomy, and obviously this is for, uh, most of the times is for a diagnosis of breast cancer, but nowadays we know that there's a lot of, about 10% of women in the population will have a gene for breast cancer. Um, the BRCA1 and 2 mutations are the most common ones you know about. We call them the Angelina Jolie mutations, but there's about 44 genes now that we've identified that are called breast cancer mutation genes. And so um, some of the other genes that we talk about are P10, CHECK2, PALB2. Those genes are also put in women at very high risk for breast cancer, so more women are electing for what we call risk reduction mastectomies. That's the new lingo. It's not prophylactic. It's risk reduction because we know that a prophylactic mastectomy makes you think it's you're never going to get cancer again, but it's not the case because a mastectomy is the best thing to reduce a woman's risk for breast cancer, but when we do a mastectomy, we can't guarantee to the patient that we've removed every single breast cell. So there's that's why um, we want to make sure that when they, they follow us, they don't just go and never come back because they need an exam. That's how you're going to find breast cancer in a woman who's had a mastectomy. They don't need mammograms or MRIs anymore. They don't get other radiology testing, but they need an exam. So um, the main indications for a mastectomy in a woman who has a diagnosis of breast cancer is basically if the lump is so big that you can't remove it with a good cosmetic result. Like a lumpectomy, you can, the goal of lumpectomy is to remove the cancer, get some extra margins, and then leave the woman with a good cosmetic result. So if the tumor is very large, getting it out may leave her with a very unacceptable result. Sometimes you can shrink the tumor first with chemotherapy, but sometimes it doesn't work. Another reason, that's, that's one of the main reasons why women will get a mastectomy. Other reasons are um, if she can't have radiation for some reason, um, like if she's pregnant, um, or if she's already had radiation, or she has something called scleroderma, which can cause this really bad radiation fibrosis. So. The main reasons women can't, uh, so if you can't have radiation, you can't have, you can't have a lumpectomy because if you have a lumpectomy, you need something to protect the breast after surgery, that's why we add radiation. So if you can't do that, that's when a mastectomy is indicated. Or a woman who's had a lumpectomy and radiation therapy previously, and then she has a recurrence on the same side, you can't go back and do more radiation, so the standard of care is to proceed with a mastectomy. Or sometimes also there's, um, Women can have what we call multicentric breast cancer. If they have more than one breast cancer in the same breast, you can't do two lumpectomies. You need a mastectomy. And one final other reason is um, if a woman has a breast cancer and she has what we call malignant appearing calcifications on the mammogram, she has lots of calcifications that are part of that breast cancer, and there's too many to remove with a lumpectomy, that's another reason. So most women who have mastectomies aren't going to need radiation, but that's not always the case. So um, you make that decision after surgery. So there's two basic patients that you see post-op. One are the women that had a mastectomy without reconstruction, and the majority nowadays are the women that have a mastectomy, and then Dr. Gardner or Dr. Schmidt or some of the other plastic surgeons perform breast reconstruction because the techniques are so good, and we want to really make the patient whole. Mm -hmm. so, um, so let's talk about first. So in general, I tell my patients, and for you guys too, those women that are having reconstruction, Dr. Gardner is the boss or the plastic surgeon yeah. rules in terms of your post-operative mm -hmm. management because I essentially took the cancer out, 
and they put them back together to make them beautiful. So I have no say in um, their like restrictions. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we both use drains, so certainly have similar ish, uh, like idea like thoughts about drains. But really, if there's any major question, they're the ones to talk to. Um, so now, mastectomy from the breast surgery standpoint, the reason we put they all come out with a drain, and that's where you guys are most important, yeah. managing the drain, watching it, because the reason we put drains in is that um, anytime you operate, there's this thing called the inflammatory response, where all, it's like any surgery is trauma to the body, and so the, your body's natural reaction is to send all these healing fluids and cytokines and stuff to wherever you removed the tissue. So if we did a mastectomy and didn't leave a drain, the patient would look like she didn't have surgery because immediately that cavity is going to fill up with fluid. We don't want that fluid to stay there because that is a lovely bacteria, bacteria, a great source of food for bacteria. So we want to minimize, you know, to reduce the risk of an infection, also allow healing so that the skin adheres to the chest wall or to your implant per se. Um, and certainly when people have reconstruction with implants, you don't want that fluid hanging around the implant because that could increase the risk for infection. So the reason we put drains in is to basically prevent, like drain the extra, what's called a seroma, or hopefully not a hematoma, but mm -hmm. um, we don't want a hematoma there either. We want all the fluid to drain out and keep it nice and dry. So drains are not there to prevent bleeding and tell us if there's, I mean obviously it's good to, it, it helps alert us to early bleeding, but the goal is really prevent infection. So. Um, and the choice of how many drains we put in is really based on surgeon preference and how much fluid we think is going to be there. So if I'm just doing a simple mastectomy, meaning I'm just removing the breast, I'm not taking a lot of lymph nodes, and also if the patient is relatively small, I'm just gonna put one drain in, but if they're heavier, which is a lot, you know, some of our patients are heavier, and I, if I did something called an axillary lymph node dissection, meaning I'm removing all the lymph nodes there, I'm gonna put two drains in because Removing lymph nodes, there's definitely a higher uh, amount of seroma because the lymph fluid fills up. Mm -hmm. And um, so you want <coughs> the drains to work. Like, if, if you, like, if you, in your first shift, you're like, oh, there's no drain output. That's not because we're perfect surgeons. That means the drain isn't working, <coughs> it's clogged, and um, the biggest concern would be the drain is clogged and there's a hematoma building up on the chest wall and that's why there's no fluid. That's why the drain is not working. So definitely, um, you know, so in the first, um, you know, the first 24 hours, usually, the, first of all, the drain output is bloody, like more of a, so I have this thing, I tell my patients, it looks like burgundy and then it's gonna look like Zinfandel, and then it looks like Chardonnay. That's kind of the color changes you should see. So, um, so it, you know, the first like first shift, like through the next day, usually it's kind of a thicker, darker red, but it shouldn't be blood. But if it looks like blood, don't ever hesitate to call us because you'd rather take the patient back sooner than later to um, to evacuate a hematoma. Um, so our biggest concern, obviously, is hematoma after surgery. Um, and the, the signs that you need to be looking for, are like the drain stop working, it's not working. So, you know, milk it and see if it starts flowing. Then, you know, definitely take a look at the drain. Like, take a look, like lift up the binder. The binder or so for me, I use a, as you'll see, a surgery bra. And actually, we just got some new ones. So starting next time you see any of my patients, they're pink. They're really pretty. They're a little softer, but they're the same kind of concept of a Velcro in front but they're more adjustable straps here and here, and they have these little rings that you can hook the um, drains to. Mm -hmm. So, um, and so I, the way I have it is I um, have the bra, and then we put, I put some stuffing on that side. So if there's any question, just peek in there and look for hematoma. Mm -hmm. And obviously that, you know, a small amount is okay, but you know, if it looks like, or any question, don't hesitate to call. They're so looking for swelling, right? Swelling, exactly. Yeah. You don't want us to completely open it. Just no, just kind of peek. Down. I mean, okay. you could, you can. You can now, yeah. You, yeah. I mean, honestly, if you need to, you can just open. Nothing's going to dramatically change. Just have someone be able to help you. You can open, readjust, and put it in. So normally, the average, like, acceptable output is probably, like, 
Well, if it's, it's, if it's like 50 cc's an hour, that's a problem. And I'm sure any one of you would be like, this is not normal. Because, you know, something, you know, that or more, especially steady, mm -hmm. that's a sign of bleeding or something not right. And, um, because uh, you're not going to make that much fluid seroma. It's not going to form that fast. Um, so usually about maybe 100 to, mm -hmm. uh, 100 to 200 over the first post-operative night is pretty average, I think. Um, so, you know, bigger people may create more seroma, and in general, the trend should go down. However, um, I definitely see, like, when I look at patients' um, post-operative drain chart, it can go up and down for a couple of days because with more activity, as they start moving, actually that stimulates fluid buildup. So, um, that, you know, they're going to have a fluctuation initially. But you definitely want to see overall a trend going down, not up. Another thing that may be a sign of hematoma is that they're having a lot more pain than you would expect. I generally find, at least from my experience, and I hear, just to hear what you guys think, is if they are complaining of a lot of chest wall pain, that doesn't seem very normal to me. I mean, those who, let's again talk about people that haven't had reconstruction. There shouldn't be a lot of pain. If they are, that's a concern that there's pressure on the chest wall because of a hematoma, too. You know. um, and obviously you're watching the vital signs too if suddenly, yeah. you know, tachycardic, their blood pressure's a little low, they look a little pale, you know. Um, thankfully, um, most hematomas uh, are not life-threatening bleeding. Um, and in general, if it's not that much, we can usually um, just monitor and maybe put another compressive binder mm -hmm. around. But any question in general, I think it's sometimes better just to take the patient back, clean out the hematoma. And usually in the OR, we never really find the bleeder. Um, it's just kind of some using and then just cleaning out the bleeding helps stop everything. Um, but So those are the our main concerns for the first post-operative night. Um, other than that, in terms of um, for recovery for a woman who's had a mastectomy, I won't, the sooner they're up, the better, because I always tell the patients, I just operated here. I didn't operate on the rest of you, so I don't want you to get a pneumonia. I don't want you to get blood clots. Um, and the more you're up, the better, I tell them. So once I tell the patients the minute you're recovered from anesthesia, as far as I'm concerned, they should get you up and moving. I don't want a bedpan nearby. I don't want you to have to get up, walk, and go pee. Um, walking around is better. In terms of... Um, restrictions on arm motion. Um, so for one thing, it's a big myth nowadays that, um, well, there's the whole, the biggest thing about removing lymph nodes when you do a mastectomy, which is most of the time, is something lymphedema, which mm -hmm. you're all aware of. And there's really no thing that causes lymphedema that we can identify that we can control. And actually the only real things that, when they look at a lot of different studies, the risk of lymphedema is associated with what we do, as in how many lymph nodes we remove. So that's why we do the sentinel node most of the time, because we're just removing one or two lymph nodes. So the risk of lymphedema is very small. It's about 3% lifetime risk. And lymphedema is never gonna happen in the post-operative period. It's gonna happen, usually it happens within a year of surgery. Um, so the risks that cause lymphedema are how many lymph nodes are removed and if they also got radiation afterwards because that's another way to scar down the lymphatics and obesity. So all the other things about blood pressure cuffs, blood draws are a myth. Although we still, all of us surgeons agree that certainly in the hospital post opera period, don't avoid if you can, you know, blood pressure cuffs, blood draws. Obviously, if they have bilateral, you just do it. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't make that much of a difference. The other thing, the main thing is avoiding infections on that, on the side that you've had a lymph node surgery because any kind of little infection can stimulate the lymphatics and then get a little clogged up. So that's why avoiding infection or if you notice a cut, clean it off, address it right away. Other than that, most of us now agree that after about a month when they've fully recovered, there's no real restrictions on blood pressure draws, IVs. There's no such thing as wearing a sleeve when you fly. I mean, if they have lymphedema, yes, but if they don't have any, 
there's really no restrictions. And in fact, we encourage, it's better to work out. It's better to do lift, like little light, white lifting weights because creating muscle tone helps the flow of all the lymphatics. So um, we ultimately want, recommend once they've recovered, just go back to what your normal activities. Um, all the breast surgeons have a little bit different in the time frame they let patients do things, but in general, most of us agree that we don't want anybody to do any major lifting for about a month after surgery, nothing more than 10 pounds after that, gradually increase. And we definitely encourage our patients to use their arms as much as possible. We don't want them to baby it, because you don't want to get a frozen shoulder, you're not going to hurt anything. So the more they feel comfortable, the better. Don't don't make them do but exercise. They're not pulling, right? Yeah. No. Ten pounds of force. So pulling, pushing, oh, gallon of milk. This is a month after. Yeah. This is a month after you're saying. After a month, they can kind of do okay. everything what they want to do. But in patient, in, in, in patient, patient you're yeah yeah doing that. yeah. 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 Okay. So for you guys, don't even worry about it. Just like yeah. do the restrictions. Don't make them strain. But um, ultimately, you can you know certainly set the tone for them that you know don't baby yourself either like don't be afraid you're not yes. gonna hurt, you're not gonna hurt anything be careful exactly um, for, so when a, from my so in terms of drain management post up you guys do a great job of teaching them and just to help them remember what our parameters are in general we, we you know and emphasize to them that they need to remember to record their drain output and bring their drain sheet back to us so we know what's going on and in general um, we want um, our rule like the parameters are less than an ounce per day which is 30 cc's for 24 hours for I generally most of us say like you want it two days in a row to make sure that it's really true because sometimes it may fluctuate and most of the times most of us take it out within 14 days okay. because then there's an issue of the longer you keep the drain in there's an increased risk for infection um, if you don't have an implant I don't send patients home with antibiotics but if you have an implant they do because of the risk of bacteria traveling up to a foreign object that's mm -hmm. going to seed something that caused a problem but um, I don't send home, people home with antibiotics I just peri up in the hospital but they go home without it if they don't have a implant again I'm not that's you know that's out of my hands. So. Um, but uh, for some people, if people have neoadjuvant chemotherapy and they're having a mastectomy, I do give them antibiotics because their immune system still is not as good. So I've seen infections. Um, I don't let people drive until the drains are out. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, even if they feel really good, God forbid, like they have to turn really quickly or you know they're just not quite there. Um, but I encourage people to walk, go out, power walk, do something outside. As long, you know, they could do whatever they want as long as they don't pull their drains out. They're not, you know, doing something harmful to themselves. I don't mind patients taking a shower after 48 hours. They can take a shower. I don't care. They can get the drain wet. They don't have an implant. Dry it off. Period. No okay. problems from my standpoint. Um, I generally have, you know, stereo strips, but sometimes for I find that with the older ladies with the more delicate skin, I'll put Dermabon on just because it's a little bit stronger. So it's just kind of my thoughts about how healthy the patient is and how good their skin is if I put Dermabon or Steri strips. Um, I generally prefer Tramadol for my pain management. And I, honestly, I feel like the older ladies, they never have pain. So you don't even have to give them that. But um, I can't think of anything else. Um, I usually see all my patients a week after surgery, no matter what. I always want to see them within a week, and I usually never take the drains out because they're not quite ready. Usually it's about 10 days, and then I just have them monitor their output and call me to come in to have the drain removed. If they have two drains, I always take one out the first week, and then I wait and monitor the other one. So, And again, so anyone who's had mastectomy after that, they're not going to need any kind of mammograms or MRIs or anything like that. It's all about an exam. And if, um, if they're going to do any kind of physical therapy, I want, you know, or I give them range of motion exercises. I want them to wait 24 hours after the drain is out to make sure the hole is sealed, and then they can start their range of motion exercises to really get their range of motion back. But they can still be doing just all the normal stuff they're doing if they feel comfortable. So, 
I think that's all I can think of right now. So questions. Well, I know that. Did you get the machine that does the intraoperative? We are not yet. <laughs> We're getting there, but it's no. We, well, they approved it, so now it's a matter of purchasing it and getting the program. So it's going to be a while still. But yeah. But will that have any implications on post-op management, or what's really the benefit to the patient? So and, it, and yeah. I don't know if y'all know about this. It's like okay. an intraoperative very specific yep. chemo? radiation. No, radiation. Mm -hmm. So, and that's really more for lumpectomies. Mm -hmm. So, ra uh, you know, anybody who has a lump, if you're having a lumpectomy for breast cancer, in general, the standard of care is to add radiation to the breast to protect the rest of the healthy tissue prevent recurrence. Um, but nowadays, so the standard used to be six weeks of radiation treatment, just to hear you come in Monday through Friday, zap zap go home but it's obviously six weeks it's a lot it doesn't make you sick but you get tired it's just you know it's hard you know to drive back and forth every day um, so people started realizing well do you need to treat everything can you just focus in on where the cancer was because that's the um, the risk of recurrence is greatest where the lump is removed and so a lot of smart people started looking at well how can we shorten the course do less radiation so now there's one regimen that is only three weeks, and then some people said, well, what if we just really up, like radiate where the cancer is? And so it's all these different technologies that come around, but bottom line is now there's something called intraoperative radiation, where literally I do the lumpectomy, and then the radiation oncologist comes in, and we have these, there's a machine that you attach a sterile ball to that's attached to a radiation source, and it's all sterile, and you place this sterile ball in the lumpectomy cavity, you close it up, temporarily with some sutures, you turn on the machine and it just radiates about a centimeter around where the cancer was. Mm -hmm. You take it out and you go home. That and so well. it's for early stage mm -hmm. breast cancer. So there's a good number of like about maybe 40% of women, if you catch your breast cancer early, you could have this and potentially it could be all the radiation you need. So you could have your lumpectomy radiation therapy in the operating room and go home. Yeah. And then you just need to come in for other things. So. Intraoperation therapy may have a role sometimes if you have a recurrence um, that maybe you would do some radiation and then do a mastectomy, depending on, it's not so much for people that you would actually see post-op as much. Um, so it, it ha has great implications for the potential that you could maybe, if you had a lumpectomy and intraoperation therapy, you might be able to have a lumpectomy again because you didn't have all the radiation, so then you could do a lumpectomy again avoid a mastectomy. Mm -hmm. Any questions? I have more questions. Yeah, yeah, sure. Go, go, for it. go for it. Of course you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, because yeah. I'm not really always yeah. at the bedside, yeah, and so yeah. I, don't, no, I don't really good. I want to know. Yeah. provide so much post-operative yeah. care. But So when you're doing the mastectomy and yep. the reconstruction, is that done in stages in the OR, or is it two separate procedures for the patient? So um, depends on how... It, like the how you work with your plastic surgeon depending so sometimes the breast surgeon will do both sides like if it's most of the time nowadays you see most women you get are bilateral right in general mm -hmm. so um, sometimes the breast surgeon will just do both sides and then the plastic surgeon will come in right away and do the reconstruction or sometimes like Dr. Ron and I often work together so I will will you know I'll do a mastectomy one side, he'll start doing reconstruction while I'm going to the other side to mm -hmm. do my part. Mm -hmm. Because that way the goal is less time in the OR. Mm -hmm. Less time, less risk for infection under anesthesia. So that's why the length can be different. And obviously, so implant reconstruction is much shorter than like tram reconstruction mm -hmm. and deep reconstruction too. Mm -hmm. And what decisions go into determining which of those options is best for the patient? So a lot of it, well, patient choice, I guess, um, and patient body habitus, her breast size, her goals, um, age. So most commonly now are implants. Part of it is that um, it's more, you know, it's less surgery impactful on the whole body because you're not, again, you're just operating up here. So it's a much faster recovery. Um, to do what we call, do y'all know what the tram flap is? Mm -hmm. You know, so you need a certain amount of um, mm -hmm. fat and skin to make a breast. So if you don't have enough, you can't do it. 
Also, if you've had other, it depends on if you've had other abdominal surgery of different scars. So the key for healing for anything is a good blood supply. And so if you have scars along your abdominal wall, those scars can, would have cut off some of the blood supply that will allow you to create the breast to survive, to, you know, work. So that may take out a woman's option. Um, and so if, sometimes if we think the person's going to get radiation, that can affect the options too, because if you radiate an implant, it'll cause it to really become really hard and cause contractures. So that's why most women, when they come out from surgery, they have expanders. Yeah. Expanders are the temporary implants that they place because a lot of times what happens is, um, you know, we, as the breast, the breast cancer surgeon, we're either doing nipple sparing or we're doing just taking like the nipple areola and like trying to preserve all the breast skin, but the breast skin isn't that, it shrinks, it's not that elastic. So even though you think that if you just took this part out, the rest of it could create the envelope for the same size breast, no, it's going to shrink and so some women want to go smaller or bigger. So and also, if you don't know everything about what your plans are, you always rather put a temporary expander and give um, the chance to heal and then expand the skin more so that you have extra skin so there's less tension so it'll heal. So um, if you don't know what size you want to be, usually that's why you get expanders. And then because expanders, if the person does need radiation after mastectomy, you take those out after they had radiation and put the final implants in. Mm -hmm. um, and in general, I think the culture is that most people want implants, although I'm sure you've all heard about... I was gonna, that was <laughs> going to be my next question. So now there's... Um, recently the FDA came out... With a warning. With yeah. a warning because there is a certain kind of... Is it lymphoma? Yes. I that think it's is lymphoma. associated with implants. Mm -hmm. And um, But it really started coming out about a couple of years ago. There's two types of... Most of the implants, like, I don't know if you've ever seen an implant, like, it looks like, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so it's, it's just like a saline, saline, saline mm -hmm. yeah. silicone, like, really smooth yeah. plastic. But yeah. then um, they started creating these called textured implants, which are rough because what happens is sometimes the implants move and they slip mm -hmm. up or they change position. And so, um, t and also to create a more natural kind of teardrop shape, um, they create these textures implants so that if it's a little rougher, that means your body's natural healing reaction is going to kind of scar in on it to keep it mm -hmm. so it won't move. Yeah. But it turns out that it looks like this causes a, yeah, a, a, a re reaction that has mm -hmm. caused this rare lymphoma. But yeah. what happens mm -hmm. is um, it yeah. causes whatever the inflammatory reaction it causes around the implant causes lymphoma. Very, very, very rare, but the classic presentation is a woman starts feeling, many years after surgery, she says swelling, so when you get an MRI and you see fluid, you aspirate it to get the cells, and then you're cured by taking the implant out. So it's not life-threatening, but certainly you don't want to get another cancer. And the issue, however, is that we used to think that it was only just the textured implant, so most plastic surgeons have stopped using that. But looking at the data, they're saying, well, any implant oh, so this is you know it's going to change people's thoughts about it i mean it is extremely extremely rare but and now we know about the it ones who all have implants right how long do they last for implants uh like, good question because you know i don't think no one ever plus sisters don't talk about this <laughs> <years, right? laughs> yeah i mean they I say 10 years, but most women, I've seen old ladies who've had the implants for 20-some years, you My know? My lady, in like two days ago, 30 years. Yeah, I mean, as long yeah, as it's not it causing a problem. Wow. Right, yeah. right. And so, I mean, what they're supposed to do, I mean, they say, <laughs> yeah, so they say, um, they kind of recommend that a woman who's had reconstruction should have like an MRI every three years to mm -hmm. keep an eye on it, and most people don't. Yeah. I mean, that's new oh. to me. They don't follow that. Yeah. And then... Um, you know, the implant's lifetime guarantee, I guess, is 10 years, but most people, they do fine without it. You know, they go many years longer, and most people don't want to have surgery again. And as you get older, the risk of surgery is, you know, higher and mm -hmm. scar tissue. So I don't think people thought about this much. Like, there's a whole new generation of people, like, probably in my career time, 
in the past five years, all of a sudden, everyone gets implants and reconstruction. It didn't used to be that way. So we're gonna. It's gonna be interesting to see ten years from now what are all these people doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was gonna ask yeah. if there was any incidence within the population of patients who had mastectomies with reconstruction and implants. Or if most of this data, because I didn't know in detail, and you might not yeah. either, or yeah. if most of this data is just from patients who just went underwent plastic surgery and got implants. I mean, the lymphoma is yeah. people who had reconstruction with implants, yeah. and um, but you know, I didn't look very closely. Like, if these are um, how long they've had their implants, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that'd be interesting to see. But I mean, the, there's not. I mean, most of it would be more recent because when I started training, you never did immediate reconstruction. You always had your mastectomy, went home, had your treatment, came back, and had delayed reconstruction. Mm -hmm. um, so and it's interesting. And another thing that um, so another reason why you have you know would have implants or not is so in terms of your. Like your diagnosis of breast cancer really doesn't affect whether or not you can have implants. It's more about your medical health to to deal with a longer surgery because you know it doubles the time. So the, we we in general we don't operate we don't offer women over seventy reconstruction because it's just a longer operation and more medical comorbidities. Or if you are other medical comorbidities like diabetes, morbid obesity, you're not going to heal well. That's not safe, you know. Um, but if you have a very health, but now people are living a long time, they're very healthy, so if you have a really healthy, vigorous 70, 75 year old woman, she could have a mastectomy, you know. We definitely try to discourage more and more women are trying to go for bilateral mastectomies even if they just have cancer on one breast. Mm -hmm. And we try to really make sure that the patients think about it very carefully because Removing a healthy breast doesn't make them live longer. It's not better for survival, but it adds, it doubles the risk of complications for surgery. So, um, longer anesthesia, high risk for infection, and a lot of times, like the problem is with the side you didn't have cancer on. So you, you know, you try to con really make sure they understand that it's not helping them live longer and it's adding more risks sometimes. So, um, you know, I think. The choice between implant and, and autologous is also driven by the plastic surgeons who'd rather do that than, so they don't offer it. <coughs> when I was training, also the tram was more popular than the implant because there was all that implant gear when I was right. growing up until the implants became safe again. Initially, when I was first training, they had to sign like a 30 page lawyer document mm -hmm. saying, I'll have an implant because they, they thought back then and it caused um, like autoimmune problems, and it doesn't. So. Um, the trend has changed and now most plastic surgeons also do the implant underneath the skin as opposed to underneath the muscle. I don't know if you've noticed a change in post-operative pain management at all, but mm -hmm. stretching the muscle causes a lot more pain than just putting it right underneath the skin. Mm -hmm. So that's why the plastic surgeons do it more for pain management. And I think it, they actually are finding that it uh, resists radiation effects like contracture as well. Um, but. I think uh, it's the culture that kind of drives the choices. Um, you know, tram flaps are much longer surgeries, although I think they last longer, obviously, because it's your tissue and it's better cosmesis. But so I always say it's a big um, investment up front, but the long term is better. People with mast, you know, with reconstruction, there's always more complications for infection. They're always going to need another revision surgery. But, you know, it's really the patients, just hopefully, they're getting. We're hoping that they're making an informed decision. Mm -hmm. So when we see like you booked with plastics and mm -hmm. like the reconstruction piece, yep. then we know they're getting the reconstruction yep. aspect of the surgery. Yep. So do we have patients who select just to have the mastectomy and then would you do mm -hmm. that solo? Yep. Okay. I think I had, yeah. recently I've had two and I, like it's been forever, like they come in waves, yeah. So those are just purely my patients, well, you know, they don't, I'm, they don't need anything special. I mean, they're pretty straightforward. Just what I talked about, how my drain management is, and stuff like that. So yeah. Um, and then. So they're really under my, like, they're my patients. So usually we come, like, what happens is the way the booking is, since the breast surgeon always sees the patient first, we book it, but then we work together. But then post operatively, the plastic surgeon takes over because they put them back mm -hmm. together, so to speak. So. And then I know um, Joanna's here from nine. 
If we were to have somebody admitted for a complication from um, the mastectomy and reconstruction, yep. typically do that. They usually get readmitted. I feel like under plastics. Yes, and then plastics will manage. Yeah. Yep, in general, unless there's something that is, was obviously related to the breast cancer, but yeah, because mm -hmm. usually it's uh, it's usually hematoma or infection. I would agree. So. That, yeah, yeah, it's pretty it's much, much what all get, of it. Yeah, get readmitted <laughs> yeah, yeah, for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you do the implant, though, the final, because you do expanders, mm -hmm. and well, plastics does. Plastics yeah, does. Yeah. But then when they come back in, is that just a in and out or? I, uh, yeah, I mean, do they ever come to you at all? I mean, sometimes it might be exchange overnight them. exchange. Oh, yeah, exchange. No. No. Yeah, no, it's just outpatient. Yeah, because yeah. it's really it's very straightforward. They just open up the incision because there's already this cavity there. They just exchange it, so there's not um, you haven't like caused a lot of pain because it's the cavity's already expanded. Mm -hmm. So uh -huh. and they don't what need to drain. What does the expander look like? Does it look uh, like the implant? Yes, it. But it's just um, yeah, it's like a disc. Okay. Yeah. But it, so it just, um, it's probably, um, a lot of times it's more of a disc shape, so it's not going to have any kind of breast shape at all, like okay. teardrop or something. And it can, actually Dr. Garner tends to inflate it with air a lot of times as opposed to saline nowadays too. So. That's interesting. And depending on where it is, like some people, you like a lot of the port is just right on the breast, but we had a really thin young woman. I. She was so thin that the port had to be put out here to inject. Mm -hmm. And then how long do patients typically follow with you after these types of procedures? Because I know that with the breast cancer, the management is very complex. Mm -hmm. It involves a lot of different specialties. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I know they'll follow up with their hematologist, oncologist. They'll follow with plastics. Yeah. They'll follow with you. Yep. But how long do you typically stay involved in those cases? Um, well, uh, minimum five years, sometimes forever. I mean, yeah. so you, the the risk. So you're following them for the risk of recurrence, and the risk of recurrence is greatest in the first two years after treatment, whether it's local or systemic. So, mm -hmm. the t usually most people have breast cancer have a radiation oncologist, a medical oncologist, a breast surgeon, and maybe a plastic surgeon. So you the you want to be seen by, we like to them to be seen about every four to six months for the first three years, and then every six months for two years, and then once a year. And if they've had a mastectomy, I see them um, once a year for an exam. I see them like, my routine is always, I see the patient for their post-op, once the drains out, then I see them three months later, just to check in kind of where they are in their care. And then for mastectomy, I see them once a year for an exam because they don't need a mammogram, they don't need any other testing and the you know the oncologists are so involved like they always see their patients I think too much sometimes but they see them at least every <laughs> three months so I know they're being actively followed mm -hmm. the plastic surgeons kind of follow them very intensely in the very early phase because of the healing issues and then usually just once a year and usually after a couple of years not at all because they don't need to mm -hmm. um, if a woman had a lumpectomy um, she's going to need a ma she's going to need her mammogram. So I, as a breast surgeon, I make sure I'm seeing them at least for the I see I try to time their mammograms and their exams <coughs> at the same time. I see my lumpectomy patients every six months for three years, and then once a year after that, kind of forever. You know, I mean, they say that on a, they the rules are like after a year of, when you finish active treatment, which is considered surgery, chemotherapy, radiation. The guidelines say that you could go back to your primary after that, but I think that's pretty overwhelming for the primary. So most primaries don't want to continue that, so we kind of keep involved. And especially a lot of women now are on tamoxifen for five years, ten years, so there's mm -hmm. lots of other things that the team is monitoring them for. And honestly, um, unfortunately, breast cancer, I think we keep it at bay, and most people don't out, like most people out, don't outlive the breast cancer risk of coming back, but it can come back. Like 30 years later, so we keep an eye on them too. I mean, most people are cured, but it's something that you know you think after five years you're done. That's just the beginning. I mean, we we don't even like when we talk about recurrence. You can see recurrence 20 years later. So, mm -hmm. and it depends on the patient. Like some patients, they make this. And I'm happy. I'm going to go back to my primary. Like fine, but if they still want to see me after five years, I'm happy to see them too. 
seemed to me, it, I mean, I, I, there was a stretch where people were getting lumpectomies, mm -hmm. and they were all, like, getting recurrence or dying. It seemed like mm -hmm. I had, there was quite a lot of that, and not so much now. Now I hear about more lumpectomies and they're past the five-year mark or, or mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. Is, are they taking less of the note? I mean, it's just biology. Just I mean, I don't know. Maybe there's a string of some bad biology or something. But honestly, that's the biology more than anything. Maybe we know more about it. I mean, um, you know, the for a while there was a whole group of women that um, didn't survive breast cancer because we didn't know about the HER2 new receptor. Do you know what that is at all? So there's three receptors that we test all invasive breast cancers for, ER, PR, HER2, estrogen, progesterone, and HER2. And until 15 years ago, probably, we didn't know about the HER2 new receptor, which was the receptor that is associated with aggressive breast cancer, and then they developed these great drugs, Herceptin, you all heard of that at all? Mm -hmm. So that is the targeted treatment to the breast cancer. And for a while, there was a group of women that were just dying of breast cancer because we didn't know about this, so the chemotherapy didn't work. So I think maybe the treatment has gotten better, but, um, you know, again, uh, it's really, surgery doesn't really matter <laughs> in the big picture. It's the chemotherapy. Like, people don't, I tell patients, I'm taking care of this, but you die from everything else. Like, I'm going to remove it and help stage the breast cancer, but it's your oncologist who's going to use the information I gave her to cure you because you, you you die of metastatic disease you don't die of local regional disease surgery in the breast and lymph nodes is not going to kill you but by staging them staging gives the us the information to treat the breast cancer to figure out how high are they what's the risk of micrometastases what's the risk of systemic disease do they need chemotherapy do they need tamoxifen so i mean i'm taking the cancer source out so you don't want to leave it there so it keeps growing but i'm not I mean, I think I'm important. Surgeons, we all think we have big egos, you know? <laughs> but we're the least important part of the process. So. Any are other questions? Are there any other cool new things that are coming or advancements that have been made I mean, recently? I think the greatest advances are the targeted treatment. Like, really, um, each, as well, have you guys, you know, Oncotype? Heard of that you know that right so oncotype so oncotype is a test so most breast cancers 80 percent of breast cancers are hormone receptor positive which is very good and her to new negative so most of the women have very good by so the key in the the biggest thing about breast cancer is the biology of the cancer is more important than the size we used to think if every woman it used to be that everyone had a tumor more than a centimeter needed chemotherapy and most people don't because if you, so we do a test called the Oncotype test of the cancer. We send it to this lab and they process the tumor and they do all these calculations and they give you a recurrence score. And it, but your tumor has to be ER positive, PR positive, HER2 new negative, which is 80% of our patients. And it spits out a recurrence score and it tells you if it's zero to 25, your risk of recurrence is so low that you do not need chemotherapy, you just take tamoxifen or Arimidex. If it's greater than 25, you should take the anti-estrogen pill plus chemotherapy. And so we've been able to really target and um, focus the care so like 80% of women over 50 do not need chemotherapy nowadays, which is huge. Still, age is a, in, like, being under 50 is an independent risk factor for breast cancer recurrence and slightly more aggressive cancer. So most women under 50 get chemotherapy. That's also most, those are the women that are high risk for having a gene for breast cancer. But so the biggest advance is that most people don't need chemotherapy because we're doing, we can really target our care and do a lot more analysis of the tumor. So, and actually the other thing is, um, the, for, but the young women that come with very large breast cancers, and I'm sure you know, you've seen a couple of these women recently on the floor, the good news is, so they get chemotherapy first and shrink the cancer, and m like more than about, at least 40% have what we call complete pathologic response, meaning like at, when we analyze all the tissue, the cancer is gone, and that is the best news. That tells you 
you can actually see it work. So then you can say, well, if it worked on a huge lump, then that's a good reflection of the micrometastases, so it's a better prog like better people. Exactly. So that's important. Like you wouldn't know, you never knew if it worked, and now you do. So I also wonder if um, like all the genetic testing kits that are out there, all those should things should not be used. I was gonna say, <laughs> has that like impacted patients coming to you and saying that they're positive for these? Some genes? actually not so many yet, but they do say that um, well actually some of them say, Oh I was BRCA negative, but those are such that's such a like uh, there's so many BRCA genes out there so that's not a good like that's we don't count that as anything I real, just you know. But about that. but I think it's going to be coming more and more because I feel like everyone I talked to did 23andMe for Christmas. So. <laughs> <laughs> like that was the big. They, were they did oh, yeah, good yeah. advertising, yeah. you know. So, yeah. but so far no. Yeah, we have we're really lucky here. We have great genetics counselors yeah. too, full yeah. time. So we're very lucky. Yeah. And they're really the most updated ones because they know, like there's it's very um, constantly changing. Every week there's new updates. So. Certainly, um, for the surgeon's world, breast cancer is not a challenging surgery. It's not like the, I'm taking out the pancreas or whatever, doing Whipple, but the care is so complicated. That's what makes it very exciting. 